Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Many of Jesus' disciples who were listening said, this saying is hard. Who can accept it? Since Jesus knew that his disciples were murmuring about this, he said to them, does this shock you? What if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life while the flesh is of no avail. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. And Jesus knew from the beginning the one who will not believe and the ones who will betray him. And he said, for this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by my Father. As a result of this, many of the disciples returned to their former way of life and no longer accompany him. Jesus then said to the twelve, Do you also want to leave? Simon Peter answered him, Master, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We've come to believe and are convinced that you are the Holy One of God. The Gospel of the Lord. So we are coming now to the end of what we've been reading in the past three, four weeks, which is the Gospel of John, chapter 6, also known as the Discourse of the Bread of Life. Let's do a little summary of what we've read in the past three weeks so that we can catch up to where we are now. And in the meanwhile, if you could project the gospel today, we could be ready for it. So we first started uh, reading about the multiplication of the breads and the feeding of the crowds. Then from there, we went to the next day where now the crowd is looking for Jesus because they want more food, they want more bread. And, and Jesus tells them, you know, look for the bread that will give you nourishment, nourishment that is eternal. Seek for the things and labor for the things that have eternal life, that have eternal fruits. The crowds then said, well, then give us some of that bread. <laughs> They're still looking for bread. But anyways, okay. And then we continue, and then Jesus says, well, I am that bread. The bread that has come down from heaven. In reference to manna, which the crowd will very well know because they're Jewish and they know the Israelites and their history and how manna was the bread that came down from heaven given to the Israelites when they were crossing the desert into the promised land. And he's saying, I am that bread that's come down from heaven. Now the crowd is going, oh, what do you mean you're from heaven? Uh, you're just the son of Joseph, not knowing that truly is not the biological son of Joseph, but the crowd don't know that. You from heaven, what are you? You're the son of Joseph, the son of Mary. How can you become now from heaven? And then Jesus emphasizes that there must be a belief in him as the bread that comes down from heaven. That if you believe in him, you will have life. So far, that's a, a typical Christian belief. Uh, accept the Lord as your personal savior, you're saved. So that's at that level. But the gospel continues. And then last Sunday, he really threw us a curve. Because then how many times? Five times, just in case you didn't get it, five times, I, that's really unheard of throughout Scripture that Jesus will repeat something five times and back to back to back to back. Almost like saying, uh, did you get it? No, okay, let me tell you again. Five times. Saying, unless you eat 
the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will not have life within you. Five times and in different ways, the same message. Now, what we read is the reaction of the crowd. So what's the reaction of the crowd? Uh, many of Jesus' disciples, now, more than just the crowd, these are now the disciples of Christ. So keep in mind there's, there's three levels here. There's the level of the crowds, there's the level of the disciples, and then the closest and most intimate friends of Jesus, the apostles. Apostles, disciples, the crowd. Now, this is what the disciples, meaning students, followers. By disciple, it means that you are a student under a rabbi, under a teacher, and you're learning from him. So these are some of his students, disciples. This saying is hard. Who can accept this? That somehow we have to eat your flesh and drink your blood? His own disciples are turning against him, saying, you've lost it. We're not going to become Draculas or carnivorous people. We're not going to eat you. What's wrong with you? And if we continue, it says, um, from that hour, uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, next slide. And the next one. And the next one. <laughs> Here, as a result of this, what does it say? Many of his disciples returned to the former way of life and no longer accompany him. This guy's gone crazy. So far, I love the teachings, but when it comes to eating him and drinking him, I'm out. Although he repeated that five times and did not change his teaching, even when he was seeing his disciples leave, he could have said something, well, hold on, hold on, let me, let me explain to you. It's not really eating my flesh or drinking my blood. It's, uh, it's symbolical language or, nope. He stayed his ground. Got to eat my flesh, drink my blood. Are we clear so far? Yeah. And especially from last Sunday, you read it yourself. We did it together five times where he re-emphasized that. All right? So is there a doubt that this is Jesus Christ himself saying to us that we have to somehow eat his flesh, drink his blood? Is there a doubt in you? Okay. It's pretty clear, right? All right. Nevertheless, some of his disciples return to their former ways of life and no longer accompany him, which is very similar to what's happening nowadays. Not just of the crowds, not just of Christians, but of the disciples of Christ, and let's use that as an analogy of Catholics in the United States, more than half of them do not believe in the real presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, body and blood, soul and divinity, in the Holy Eucharist. Even though we've already read it and it's very clear, and then when you put it in the context of the Last Supper, in the three synoptics of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the three of them repeat the same narration that Jesus took bread and said, this is my body. He took wine and said, this is my body blood do this and ever since the church has been doing it and when you put it in the context of the last supper and then in the context of what he did at the cross giving his own body being pierced and giving off his own blood oh now we get it we have the advantage of theological development and the clarification as an understanding okay that's the holy eucharist we got that yet more than half of the Catholics in the United States do not believe in it. Even more shocking, I brought the actual numbers because the faces you gave me last Sunday is like, that can't be true. 
I brought the actual statistics. According to the Center for Applied Research, Research in the Apostolate, also known as CARA, um, they did the survey July 11, 2022 to August 2, 2022, and it states, major findings, the first bullet point, 17% of adult, adult Catholics attend Mass at least once a week. Only 17%. That's not enough. I look for another survey that could uh, either confirm or deny. And then I write this one. This is from the Pew Research Center. They have an article, Nine Facts About U.S. Catholics, the bullet point number six. About three in ten U.S. Catholics, 28%, say they attend Mass weekly or more often. So now we add in the weekly with the more often, and at least the number goes up, 28%. And it says the following. I like this. It says, overall, 20% of U.S. Catholics say they attend Mass weekly and pray daily and consider religion very important to their life. 20%. Now, in contrast, 10% of Catholics say they attend Mass a few times a year or less and pray seldom or never and consider religion not too important at all in their lives. So we have the two extremes. You got the 20% come to Mass weekly, pray daily, and understand religion to be important, 20%. And the other extreme is the 10% that only goes to Mass once in a while, uh, prays rarely and doesn't think religion is important in their life. Now, in the context of the first reading, in which we hear of Joshua speaking to the Israelites and tells them, decide today. Whom you will serve. Are you going to serve the gods of this world? Or are you going to serve the true God? And then he continues to take the first step as to exemplify making the decision. And then we have this famous phrase that I'm sure if you go to Hobby Lobby, you'll see it in many artwork or as some you could order online. The famous saying that says, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Question. Today, make your decision. Where do you stand? Are you going to stand with that 10% that hardly ever go to Mass? Hardly prays and doesn't consider religion important? Or are you going to stand with the 20% of the Catholics in the United States who come to Mass regularly, who pray daily, and truly believe that religion is important to their life? Make your decision. Make a decision today and live by it. I'm going to take the step even further. And following the second reading today, can you project the second reading? If you are able to. A scripture that is often abused and misunderstood. And ladies, I, I feel you, some of your hairs. <laughs> Why that scripture today? Especially after I had this situation with my husband. That's how the spirit works. <laughs> But it is a text that is abused and misunderstood, and often by men themselves, very conveniently, of course. Brothers and sisters, be subordinate to one another out of reverence for Christ. Why should be? <laughs> I, let me see. I, okay, ladies, you say it. Let's see if we can say that word together. One, two, and three. Subordinate. Oh, yeah. To your heavy. Okay. Other translation to the word subord subordinate could be uh, submissive, which I don't know if it's worse. 
submissive to your husband. I'm glad we don't have books in the pews. <laughs> Probably be throwing them at me. You can throw your purses. We'll put it in the collection. Okay, good. <laughs> subordinate, submissive. Um, another translation could be subordinate, su subject. That's another translation. All going to the Greek word that implies you placing yourself under the order, the mission of the husband. But that implies... That the husband knows what his mission and what he's been ordered to do. So if the husband knows what is the order, this is a commandment, an order he received from God. This you must do. And if he's following that order given by God and fulfilling that mission, I believe no one here will have any problem being submissive, subordinate, subject to a man who's living out that order and that mission. What is the mission, you may ask? And hopefully husbands are going, hmm, I wonder what is my mission? Good. Let's continue the next, re the next slide. Uh, we're still talking about wives here. Let's go to the next. Oh, hold on. Let's go back. For the husband is the head of the we wife to Christ. Uh, just as Christ is the head of the church, he himself the savior of the body. As the church is subordinate to Christ, so wives should be subordinate to their husband and everything. Next one. Husbands. Here's your mission. This is what's been ordered by God for you to fulfill. Love your wives. Give her a little kiss if she's next to you right now. Love your wives. But then, very specific. It's not just a little kiss that I heard over here. More than that. Because it's very clear how to love. In the way Christ loved the church. Meaning, laying down your life for her. Now, ladies, if your husband was willing and in practice loving you and laying down his life for you, why won't you let him? That's another issue. Often we struggle to receive love. Often we feel not worthy or, okay, if I receive it, we'll only come afterwards. You know, I'm sure he's going to ask for something afterwards. Or, but we're not going to go there. But if he's truly living out to his mission and following the order that he received from God as a command, then simply to be submission is to be under the mission of this man who is laying down his life out of love for you. To be subordinate is to be under the order he received to love you. Now you don't, now all of a sudden you don't, you like the word now, huh? <laughs> you don't find it as difficult. Good. Because now it's properly understood in truth. So when I go back to Joshua saying, As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. He's speaking as a man fulfilling his mission and the order he received from God and the responsibility of laying down his life in service and for the salvation of his own household, wife and children included. Just as Peter, speaking on behalf of the entire church, saying to Jesus, once the disciples left, Jesus turns to the apostle and says, do you also want to give, leave? Disciples left. You want to go? Go. And Peter, on behalf of the church, says, oh, don't worry about going there. <laughs> to whom shall we go? Actually, do look for it. We've come to believe and are convinced that you are the Holy One of God. You have words of everlasting life. 
Where else can we go? But you see, the stand that Joshua took, the stand that Peter took, is a stand that I now challenge you men to decide today who are you going to serve? To whom you're going to follow? And in doing so, to lay down your lives so that your wife and your children will also follow. You're following me? Before I go into concrete call for action, particularly to men, let's go back to the gospel. Because men, this can give you a sense of how you can take that stand as Peter did. Specifically in regards to the Holy Eucharist and specifically in regards to now this being your order, your mission to make sure that you and your household are here every Sunday praying daily and teaching that religion is important. You're either in the one ten percent or in the twenty percent that do come to Mass weekly, pray daily, and believe religion to be important. You make a decision and decide today. How did Peter respond? Say, Master, where else shall we go? You men, have you found something better than Jesus Christ? I tried. And not only did I not find it, I ended up being worse for trying to find something. Broken, hurt. There is nothing out in the world that can fulfill all the desires of my heart except in Jesus Christ. You make a decision and decide today, where else can you go? And if you want to look around and continue looking around, good luck. You will suffer the consequences of it. You're free. But are you truly free to accept that Jesus Christ is the answer? And then Peter says, you have the words of eternal life. I have come to believe and are convinced. A belief and a conviction. You see, it is important, especially when it comes to the understanding of the great gift of the Holy Eucharist. It is truly something hard to understand. It is truly something difficult to conceive that God becomes present in a piece of bread and a little bit of wine. What? That's unconceivable. I, it makes no sense. It is a hard teaching. But if you believe because it makes sense, it won't make any sense. It'll take you a long journey. Peter stuck around because not what Jesus was saying, but because he was convinced and believed that Christ was the Savior. And if Christ is the Savior, the Holy One of God, the one that fulfills all my desires, my Savior, my King, and my Lord, whatever he says, I'll believe. Because I believe in him as my personal Savior, and what he says for me can only be for good. So that if it doesn't make any sense that truly in this little piece of bread and a little bit of wine is the real presence of Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Believe it not because I'm teaching it. Believe it because Christ himself said it. And because I believe in him, I believe in anything and everything he says. Men, I speak to you especially if you're in the middle of raising children. It is your turn to make a decision. Whom are you going to follow? I invite men to stand up. 
if you consider yourself a man, I don't know. <laughs> Have you come to believe and are convinced that Jesus Christ is the Holy One of God? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Are you decided? Have you decided and make the decision today in front of your wives, your children, live stream, the whole world is watching. Make a stand today. Make a decision. Do you want to stand with the 10% of the Catholics in this nation who hardly ever go to Mass, don't pray daily, and don't think of religion as important? Or do you want to stand with Peter, with Joshua, with the great saints, with that 20% of Catholics in the United States who come weekly, pray daily, and believes that religion is important for their lives. Where do you stand? 20% or 10%? Do you stand with the few who stayed after the discourse of the bread of life? Now, men, if that is so, it's time to exercise what's been ordered and mission for you to fulfill. And this becomes ever more necessary on Sunday mornings. Have you not noticed that every Sunday morning all hell breaks loose? Literally, all hell will break loose to impede you and your family from being here. That is your fight. That is you being called to order, to mission, to fight, to defend, to lead. Fight those demons, the Sunday morning demons that are out there impeding you from coming here. Fight them and you fight them. Not your wife, not your children. Be the man. Stand against those evil spirits and you come here regardless of what comes your way. Because once you made it here, that is a victory for you, a victory for your family, for your wife, for your children, and you saying in action, I make a decision and I live by it. I will fulfill my mission. I will live out to the order and I will be there. Not just weekly, pray daily as to exemplify that to your children and to inspire it in your wife. And do make of religion something essential, important for you, especially the developing and loving relationship with Jesus Christ who makes himself available here as body blood, soul, and divinity, a bread that has come down from heaven to nourish you, to strengthen you, and to give you all the graces that you need to take that stand and to live by it. I'm going to take even a step further. If you're ready to stand with that 20%, and if you're ready to say publicly as for me, and my household, we will serve the Lord, then come to the front. This is an altar call. Let's see who takes the stand and comes all the way to the front. And if not, you could just sit down. Nobody will be watching. <laughs> Except your wife and your children will be greatly disappointed. <laughs> Ladies and children, extend your hands towards this man. Almighty God and Father, bless them. Today they have decided, as for them and their household, they will serve you. They will follow you. They will be with you and are willing to lay down their lives for their wives and their children. Bless them, Father. 
And we know that we are weak. And although our desires to say yes and to stand strong, often our weaknesses take over. We may be ready to quit. But Lord, we know that you are present in the Eucharist. And by coming Mass after Mass, we will receive the strength that we need to fight the good fight and to do so out of love for you and out of love for our wives and children. Heavenly Father, bless this man here present. Bless them. Hear the prayers of their wives and the children right now as they raise their hands in intercession and praying upon them. Anoint them to be men of God as I now bless them in your most holy name. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Man, repeat after me. As for me, and my household, we will serve the Lord. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, man. You can return.